Stop thinking about pricing in silos. Pricing has a waterfall that continues well beyond that. It continues into how you're going to do discounting into the channel, whether it's the ship and debit process or whether you're paying out a rebate, whether you're paying out price protection on the inventory that, out, that is out there. All these things at the end of the day bring down that waterfall to its final net result. And pricing doesn't end with optimization. It doesn't end with analytics and it doesn't end with the baseline execution of a price and a quote or a contract. It continues operating. And unless you can really bring these things into a single continuum, you are invariably going to leave money on the table without any doubt. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Plus 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the data-driven relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Hanan Greenberg. Here are three things you want to know about Hanan before we start. He is the Senior VP and General Manager of High Tech at Model N, which we're going to talk quite a bit about. He and I first met when I was a Pricing Director at Maxim, and I was advocating for Model N as a solution there. He is an amateur astronomer. I didn't know that about him. I find that fascinating. And okay, I'll give you a fourth one. He has the best voice of anyone I will ever have on this podcast. Welcome, Hanan. Thank you, Mark. I will uh, try to get my uh, radiophonic voice working for you today. You don't even have to work at it. Your voice is so amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hey, I want to ask a really quick question about astronomy, if I could. By all means. My wife and I bought a spotting scope for birds, and then we took a, we bought a little mount that goes over the IP so I can put my iPhone on there and take pictures, and it's horrible. I'm guessing that there are telescopes or spotting scopes that have digital lenses already built into it, and I can just connect it to my computer. Is that true or not? It is true. There are some telescopes that have built-in um, CCD chips. Uh, and CMOS chips that can actually uh, capture images for you just like a camera would. And they're actually designed specifically for astronomy applications. So they have some nifty cooling functionality that reduces noise from the image. So there are some scopes that have those built in. Although most serious amateur astronomers will use a separate camera that is specifically designed for deep space imaging and is, you know, has special adapters to attach to the telescope. But they're pretty cool toys. Well, you can never have enough toys. That's my philosophy. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, let's start this off with, how did you get into pricing? Did you actually get into pricing or did you find yourself at Model N? So when I joined Model N uh, a, a short 15 years ago, Model N was already positioning itself as a revenue management company where pricing was a part of the continuum. And essentially, it, it covered everything from pricing to deal negotiation to commercial incentives in the forms of chargebacks and rebates, as well as some regulatory processes, including government pricing. So Model N had all those constructs when I already joined uh, back in 2005, and they were specifically geared towards the life sciences space. And when I joined, the goal was to uh, expand Model Lens reach into other verticals. And as we started narrowing our focus down on high tech and high tech manufacturing, that drew our attention more and more to pricing as a key lever to help these companies drive more value. So uh, while we do rebates and uh, discount, you know, performance rebates, discount rebates, inventory management and other things for our high tech customers, really that vision of an end to end pricing continuum that factors in all the components was the key driver and remains the key driver for our business in high tech. Yeah, just so I can get my arms around this, when you say the words high tech, what industries are we talking about? Can you give us a few examples? Sure, the sub industries that we uh, cover in high tech include the following. You have semiconductor and component manufacturers as one segment. Uh, another segment would be networking and wireless. Another one would be data storage solutions. Uh, for, uh, the, the next one after that would be consumer electronics, and one after that would be software. We actually exclude medical device out of our definition of, of high tech, although many, many analysts would include medical device as part of high tech. We actually view that as part of our life sciences business. 
because of some unique attributes of, um, of many companies there that are more aligned with the rest of the life sciences business. You and I met out of the semiconductor industry and semiconductors I find just amazingly complicated and unique in that they have this ship and debit and registrations and all these weird things that go on in selling through a channel. So having a product like Model N to help manage all that just makes tons of sense. Do those other industries have similar problems or quirks about them that make it really useful for a company like Model N to, to jump into that space? Yeah, I think that if you were to take it in the simplest form, the commonality across all the segments that we that we operate in is the combination of very high volume of transactions, a large uh, product catalog. In other words, you have more than one or two products, but hundreds or thousands of SKUs in your in your catalog, and a mixture of thousands and you know sometimes tens of thousands or more of customers. Uh, when you overlay that with a fulfillment that is going through a channel, you've created the perfect condition to get things wrong. And what I mean by that is whether it's negotiating pricing with a channel while an end customer has already agreed to pay a certain price, but you find yourself renegotiating a new price with the channel that's doing the fulfillment, not really creating the demand. Unless you can create linkage between these processes, you're going to be leaving money on the table. The, the fact that every end customer can effectively become their own price point for a specific SKU, managing that process effectively, again, has a great upside opportunity to actually uh, increase pricing and capture more pocket uh, price from that end customer, but it also creates the opportunity of actually bleeding margin into the channel. So these commonalities exist across virtually every segment that I just mentioned. It doesn't really matter if it's semiconductor or if it's uh, uh, data storage. If you, if you think of, of a disk as, as a, you know, a computer disk as, as a product, you can take the same disk and you know, sell it as an embedded solution in a laptop. You can sell it as a standalone external storage solution you know, through, through a B2B uh, you know, uh, value chain, or you could be selling it through a consumer value chain like, I don't know, Best Buy or, or Fry's. But you can also have other end customers like, uh, you know, cloud providers, you know, Google and AWS are big consumers of storage solutions. So multifaceted segmentation of the different end markets, the exact same product will go to, but it will have different pricing points for each one of these markets. And then you overlay that with geo differences and you overlay that with end customers negotiating their own specific price through channels. And you have the exact same problems that, that semiconductor companies have which is just getting control over that price, the baseline price execution correctly, and then factoring in the fact that once you've negotiated whatever discount you have, you might still be paying out a discount rebate, which is the equivalent of the ship and debit and semiconductor for the rest of high tech to, to the uh, channel. You might be paying performance rebates. You might be paying price protection on the inventory if you're changing the values of inventory. Over time, all these same problems apply to virtually every aspect of, of high tech, with perhaps one exception in the software space where they don't really have inventory or not, you know, not, not traditional inventory there to deal with. So elements like price protection may fall out, but all the other elements of controlling the discounting, consistent execution of the pricing, the payments of uh, rebates and discount rebates, they all still apply. Okay, I got to say that as you went through that list of different scenarios, I was getting, um, I don't know, antsy because every one of them felt so painful. Now, in case our listeners didn't really understand all that, I want to give you a really clear example. Uh, back when I was working in the semiconductor space, what would happen is we would have negotiated a contract with a really big customer. Uh, for the sake of argument, let's call it uh, HP. So we would negotiate a contract with HP. And so when HP wanted to buy from us, we sold them a part for a dollar. And then we would get a request from one of our distributors that said, hey, we've got this customer out there that wants to buy 100,000 pieces. Uh, they want to pay 80 cents. Would you do that deal? We have to somehow find a way to figure out that that deal was actually HP. We already had a contract with HP for a dollar. And if we had bid 80 cents, we would have just lost or given away 20 cents on 100,000 units. Exactly. And, and some of the problems are even, even simpler than that. If you just think of the sheer volume that these companies need to deal with, uh, where you know these companies are handling tens of thousands of quotes 
on a monthly basis. And um, as much as 50 to 60 percent of these quotes require some special price review. Um, there, there's uh, you know a customer saying that they want a better price, as simple as that, or it could be that the you know a competitor is offering a better price, and there's there's that sort of pressure. For whatever reason, about 50 to 60 percent of all transactions in high tech are a special price request. So in essence, what we're saying is we're taking your carefully planned price book and the wonderful segmentation and price curves that you've created and throwing them out the window and we're going to deal with this deal as a one-off and that's what you're doing 50 or 60 percent of the time and with that kind of volume you just cannot continuously throw more people at it at some point there's just so many people who could be you know product line managers or a deal desk or a sales operations function that can just review every single one of these deals and and because they can't do it they don't do it and the result is they focus on the higher value deals because obviously they have the biggest impact. And then the rest of the deals, probably 30 to 40 percent of those deals, simply automatically default to the lowest approved price because they know that they can approve that price. They don't have time to review the deal in any more detail, so they just approve it. That is not the way to optimize pricing and optimize the revenue you're going to make on the deal. And that's where it becomes really important to support these processes with pricing automation. And that's one of the key things the Model N focuses on. Yeah, that just sounds incredible. But one of the questions that I wanted to talk to you about is, does Model N fit well with smaller companies? And it sounds like the answer to that is no. It sounds like you have to have really big transaction volume, customer base, SKU count. I, I think it's fair. I think it'll be helpful to perhaps put numbers against what is small and what is big. I think that if you're a $20 million company or a $50 million company, the one thing that's keeping you up at night is how do I become a $100 million company or a $150 million company? And it's less about am I leaving 1% of margin on the table or more. I think that when you, when you start hitting the 200, 250 million range in revenue, that's when you start seeing enough volume and enough complexity to really start feeling the pains, and more importantly, you can actually quantify them. So if, if you're a company that's, let's say, still relatively small, but you're growing at 10%, 15%, and someone can show you that you might be leaving five extra points on the table with different you know, processes that can be optimized, that now starts becoming meaningful to your business. So normally we would say that um, the lower end of the range that we work with is around 200 to 250 million. And yes, as they get bigger, the value increases and obviously the pains and complexity that they're dealing with uh, are, are bigger. About 75% of Model N customers are greater than a billion. So anywhere between one to 50 billion is sort of the range that we typically serve. But about 25, maybe a little more than 25% of our customers are now are between the 250 million to 1 billion range. Yeah, it's interesting because back when I advocated for Model N, I was at a, let's call it a one and a half billion dollar company. And I could clear, I picked out or found nine different places where we're leaking money just through bad quoting processes, bad bad pricing. And we quantified that to over a hundred million dollars a year. That's, it's not shocking. It's not shocking at all. Yeah, that's, and, and so that, I mean, if you think about a hundred million, what is it? That? That's 10% of a billion dollars. That's a big number. It is a big number. And I think, again, we model N, we, we uh, like to set up our uh, sponsors to, um, you know, under promise and, and overachieve so they can be the heroes of the day once we're successful at a deployment. So we, we never claim that you can really capture everything. You know, I mean, the, you're right that it could be as much as 10 percent being left on the table. But there are so many, you know, um, uh, variables that impact how much of it you can really optimize. And so typically we tell people, you know, if you go in with a anywhere between a three to five percent improvement rate, that is safe grounds. That is an area where you can pretty much bet your money on that you will be able to deliver that value to the company. And we, we're very pleased that we have customers that have obviously exceeded that. Do you think there are any lessons here for small businesses? So, so we're not going to talk about Model N for just a second. And do you, do you think that there are things that small companies could do that said, hey, we should focus more on this uh, quote process that we put in place? I think that, um, you know, there's, there's two things I'd say. Number one is 
if you believe in the value of your product and your differentiation and the reason that you exist, don't be subservient to the rest of the value chain. Uh, there's, a, there's companies who fear the value chain they operate in and they're afraid to not even, I'm not necessarily saying demand higher pricing or avoid discounting. I'm saying asking for information. So if you're working through channels and you want to understand who is the end customer, what are they willing to pay to determine how much you're willing to discount, that's a legitimate ask, especially if you're providing these channels with various forms of protection and incentives, whether it's price protection, whether it's uh, deal registration programs, whether it's uh, you know the ship and debit program or rebates, you're giving quite a bit into the channel. It's legitimate to ask, and yes, and yet I do see companies especially on the smaller end, still fearing to demand the data that they really should have to run their business effectively. If you do not understand what your end customer is doing and, and it becomes an opaque situation through a variety of different types of channels, you're not really in control of your own destiny. And so I think that is one thing that I would, I would advise uh, small companies. And, and the other one is never assume that you can make up on bad business by, uh, you know, by scaling the volume. Because bad business is bad business, whether it's big or it's small. So, um, you know, having a good discipline on understanding what are our goals from a margin, where do we want to take the company, and instilling that even long before you bring in tools. Long before, you know, even, even if your own, only tool is an Excel spreadsheet, you can still instill that culture and that process in a company so that when you are ready to scale and bring in tools, those tools should be an enforcement of an existing policy, not a completely new learning of, oh, now now margins and, and revenue optimization are important. They're always important. Yeah. I think both of those are phenomenal recommendations for small businesses or any business actually. But I wanna, I wanna just pound on that first one you said. If a company doesn't own the end user data, if you don't have a relationship with your end users, then it's impossible to truly know what they value to get them the next version of the product to capture the value that we're delivering. So everybody should have that, have access to that data and information, have a relationship with those end customers. But how is Model N different from other pricing companies, pricing software out there? I think that the key difference between Model N and all the other pricing vendors out there is, is really twofold, or maybe, maybe I'll put it into three buckets. The first one is, where are we coming from? All of the pricing tools out there, if you go to PPS and you see the, the pricing, uh, the Professional Pricing Society event, and you see all the pricing vendors there, they all came from the exact same background, which is pricing analytics and pricing science. And the underlying assumption with many of them was that the underscoring capabilities of price execution are already there. They're taken care of by CPQ or by ERP or something else, and they just work fine. And all you really need to do is to tweak the front end of the process by dialing in on, on micro segmentation and finding out where you can optimize a price curve in one product line or in one end market or in a different region. And that's just going to give a ton of value up front. And there is credence to that, to that point of view, because if you look at specific industries, that has actually worked really, really well. You can look at the process manufacturing space and the chemical space. You can look at uh, travel and accommodation, even in distribution, um, uh, beverage and alcohol. There have been a few industries where that assumption has been proven to be absolutely true and great value has been attained there. Model N comes from a very different angle, which is actually price execution itself is quite broken. And so if you're not going to fix that, no matter how well you fine tune the upfront price book, your ability to execute that is going to be significantly uh, you know, impacted. And what we have found, because we're a vertical company, and that's the other big difference, is we don't try and be everything for everyone. If a, if a CPG company you know, reaches out to us, an oil and gas company reaches out and says, we'd like your solution, we are unlikely to engage unless it's a miraculous fit out of the box, and then maybe. But generally, <clears throat> we're going to stay focused on the industries that we really understand, and why is that important? Because, for example, in high tech, it is a different market dynamic than oil and gas or process manufacturing or all the other industries. It is very hit driven. It's very dependent on macroeconomics. 
and the ability to go and build predictive modeling on what your pricing should be three quarters out is not there. You know, you, you can build an algorithm to tell you what should a, a, a plane ticket price be uh, between November 15 and December 15, you know, December 25 in this country, because you have seasonality, you have things that play in there. Whereas high tech is is really operating on a different dynamic. Also, the speed in which new products are being introduced is significantly higher. So when you're introducing a new product, past performance is not really relevant. So you can't really draw on that to conclude what you should be doing. And therefore, we found that the focus on price execution, deal optimization, and controlling the end-to-end -end process of upfront discounting and post deal incentives to be the most consistent way to deliver value in any market, in any product you know, family, for any high-tech company. And I think those are the key differences between, uh, between Model N and other pricing vendors. It's really our focus on the industry and the angle that we're coming at, at it compared to the others. If you take a look at public case studies, just do a tally of uh, public case studies in high tech for pricing solutions, you will find that Model N has more public case studies than all the other pricing vendors combined because of the challenges I said earlier on. Yeah, it almost sounds to me like it's an and, not an or, as in I should pick up a pricing optimization software package to price my older products, not the new releases, and yet I still need to manage the channel. I still need to manage the revenue execution piece. In principle, you're right. In reality, I have rarely seen that work. And I'll, I'll explain why, at least from my opinion. First of all, when I look, and I've seen at least, uh, I don't know, 15 different projects of uh, price optimization and pricing analytics solutions in the tech industry, uh, you know, at a minimum, probably seen more of them that, that did not use Model N. They bought into the story of that upfront optimization and they try to implement it, and most of them were not successful. What happens then is nobody wants egg on their face. They try and figure out, well, how else can I use it? And then they end up using it for price execution. So a company may have bought a pricing analytics solution initially, but because that didn't work after a year or a year and a half, they convert it into, okay, well, we're gonna try and use this for our quoting. And then they get stuck with a solution that actually wasn't really well designed to do quoting, for example as their tool of choice. And that means it comes at the expense of a system like Model N that would be more relevant to that use case. And so I, I can tell you that, that probably 60 or 70% of the deals that Model N has done in the last five years has been simply replacing pricing analytics tools that have been converted into you know, price execution tools with Model N's price execution. Yeah, I think if I were, if I were gonna to try to do both at the same time, or I'm sorry, if I'm gonna to try to do both, I would do price execution first. I remember when we um, installed Model N, probably the single biggest problem we had was getting the data cleaned up, right? Getting a customer master and making sure all the part numbers were in correctly and not multiple times. And, and without clean data, you really can't do price optimization. I agree. And I think, you know, I think that if you have good price execution in place, whether it's with Model N or, or, or a different solution, then bringing in a solution that can help you do the micro segmentation, you know, try and, and change the curves of your product lines to adapt to specific market dynamics that you may have in, in different end markets or different territories, I think definitely has a creed of value. So I don't want to sound like I'm knocking it completely, but you do need to sequence it the right way. And then secondly, you really need to stick to it because what I've found in, in many companies is they think it's like a magic formula. You, you implement it, you did it, and now it's just supposed to continue spewing out great pricing for you. When in fact, you have to keep on feeding that beast every quarter and not every company has the discipline and the personnel to do that. And so I see companies start off on that, on that trail. And then after a while, they just back off and say, well, it's too hard to keep these things maintained and they just rely on good price execution. So I do believe the value is there, but not every company has the discipline and the personnel at, from a skill set standpoint to do that work well. Nice. Hey, Hanan, I have so enjoyed this conversation. Before we wrap up, I always ask the following question though. Uh, what's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? The one advice on pricing is Stop thinking about pricing in silos. A lot of people tend to think of pricing either as uh, something that they're doing upfront when they're setting a price book, 
or when they're determining, you know, the uh, you know how they're going to execute the pricing and and different pricing rules and tools that they're going to use for quoting and contract negotiation. And they don't really think about the fact that pricing has a waterfall that continues well beyond that. It continues into how you're going to do discounting into the channel, whether it's the ship and debit process or spa debits and the rest of high tech. Whether you're paying out a rebate, whether you're paying out price protection on inventory that, out, that is out there, all these things at the end of the day bring down that waterfall to uh, you know, its final net result. And pricing doesn't end with optimization, it doesn't end with analytics, and it doesn't end with the baseline execution of a price in the quote or a contract. It continues operating, and unless you can really bring these things into a single continuum, you are invariably going to leave money on the table without any doubt. Um, and that is the big advice. Stop thinking about pricing in silos. So if you're, you know, if I give a, a practical example, if you're negotiating a discount with, let's say, a channel, and that channel is also entitled to a performance rebate on the back end, all right, if they sell a million units or something, they're going to get three points, okay? But now they're in the deal asking for a 10-point discount. If you keep on operating in silos, you're going to give them the 10% discount, and then you can also, also pay them 3% on the performance rebate at the end of the day. But if you stop thinking in silos and you bring these things together, now you're going to say to the channel, well, Mr. Channel, I'm giving you the 10 points you asked for. Three points you're getting as a rebate at the end of the day. I'll give you a seven-point discount right now. I've given you what you asked for, but for the company, I've just saved three points unnecessary discounting. So if you stop thinking about pricing in silos and think about it as an end-to-end -end process, there is significant value to be had. Nice. That is, uh, that is absolutely fantastic. All right. Episode 51, all done. Uh, my favorite part. Let's see. I think this is the clearest I've ever heard on revenue management and the difference between what Model N does and what the uh, pricing optimization companies do. So uh, excellent job for that, Hanan. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to be here. Hanan, thanks for your time today. If anyone wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, simplest way is email. Uh, it's uh, C as in Charlie, Greenberg is G R W E N as in Nancy, B E R G at modeln.com. I'm happy to respond to any inquiries or on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Excellent. Thanks, Hanan. For our listeners, what was your favorite part of, of today's podcast? Let us know in the comments or wherever you downloaded and listened. And while you're at it, would you please leave us a five star review? They are very valuable to us. Don't forget, we started a new community on Champions of Value, a place where you can see all of the things that we publish. Uh, you can get there easily at community.championsofvalue.com. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast or about pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Impact.